So welcome to our first online webinar um, discussing metadata production for the AASG geothermal data contributions for the National Geothermal Data System. And uh, looks like we've got 26 people now online. I still am showing some lines muted. I think I've unmuted everyone that I can mute. But if you're not using your mic please do mute it so that, that uh, we don't get a lot of feedback and weird distortion sounds. So, diving right in, um, we'll be talking about metadata for, for the online resources in the geothermal data system today. Um, I'd like to, I'll start out, here's a brief outline of what we'll be covering. Um, I'll first of all talk about what is the catalog, and then uh, have a short summary of the metadata content model and then show some examples of what user applications look like um, in terms of how the, how the metadata gets used. And then we'll dive into some various workflows that we've developed for creating metadata. And that includes what we call our metadata wizard and US GIN repository, which are both online tools and also workflows that involve populating a table, either in a spreadsheet or an access database um, that's then converted by a computer program to XML for loading in the catalog. And then finally, we'll finish with the question and answers at the end. So uh, I don't know if that's showing up. Get out of the way. So what is the catalog? When I talk about catalog, it, it gets used a lot of different ways, unfortunately. It's one of those, those words that has a lot of different meanings get bandied about. But in general, what I'll be talking about is the collection of metadata records that describe the resources available in the, in the network. So the catalog is the collection of records that describe the resources that are out there. So these records are structured. That is, the, they have a consistent information content. And that content is arranged in some kind of structured format, whether it's XML or a table or, or whatever. It doesn't really matter. But they're structured, it's arranged to enable automated extraction and location of particular information in the record. And that's what differentiates what we'll call structured metadata from unstructured metadata of the sort that, that is used by Google or Yahoo or most of the, the online search engines that we deal with a lot. They just comb through text and build relationships between web pages or other kinds of resources based on, on links or on web traversals or associations between words. And so they, they try to guess semantics from, from those sorts of things, whereas in structured metadata, there's a lot more semantic context, content that's asserted by how the information is structured. The metadata records are shared. So each one of these metadata records you could think of as an advertisement for some resource that somebody in the network wants to make available for other people to use. So they're meant to be distributed widely and easily. Um, and, and as such, they, they sort of public information. But each metadata record is owned by some, some agent that's the steward of the, the resource that's described. And so um, this, is the, this is the party that would be responsible for maintaining the information in that metadata record and making sure that it's accurate that it gets updated if something changes about how you access the resource or whether it becomes, if it's deprecated or taken offline or something. So there's some responsibility there with the metadata owner to make sure that the metadata content um, stays reliable. So what's in the catalog? Ideally, there's a single metadata record for every resource that's floating around out there that people um, want to make available. In order to realize this goal, of course, it's quite difficult. And um, we have the project partners in the, in the geothermal data system projects are creating and submitting records for resources. And in order to try to, as much as possible, maintain this discipline of a single metadata record for each resource, the idea is, is that, that individual project partners would create metadata records for resources that, that, that they have created. So the Arizona Geological Survey makes metadata for the publications and information resources that we publish, for instance. Or that they make meta metadata records to their information. So for instance, we might create metadata records for things that we have in our file cabinets here that we know don't exist anywhere else. And 
and then finally, um, somewhere in the system, there has to be some accounting for sort of legacy resources that no one else is going to be claiming. So there's a variety of kinds of gray literature out there that may may pertain to one or more different states, and this will probably be one of the more difficult issues to try to deal with about you know how do we how do we try to assert, maintain that there's one metadata record for those kind of things, and really it's just going to be an ongoing question of probably doing you know continuing quality assessment against the catalog to try to identify duplication and remove it. In the uh, SMU geothermal data system project that Dave Blackwell is working on with the, the, uh, the people at Siemens, and I think some of them might be online, I don't know Fabian, but they're, they're working on um, programs to identify duplication of metadata records for publications. And hopefully we'll be able to apply this on a sort of system scale in the long run and just maybe have have um, services that will comb the catalog looking for duplication and trying to reduce the amount of duplication. But that's a, that's a down the road thing. Our, in the near term, our, our, in the projects we're doing now, the idea is to try to avoid duplication by not creating metadata for things that are very probably going to be created, have metadata records created in other places. So this would include things like publications, you know, GSA Bold, stuff that's coming from the um, Geothermal Resource Council, um, OSTI publications, a lot of DOE publications, things from um, the GeoHeat Center or, or um, EGI that are, that are being handled within the, under the auspices of the BSU project. So this is something to be aware of when, when, we're, when you're creating metadata. So what's the purpose of the metadata? And first and foremost, the idea is to make it allow people to be able to find resources. When you're looking for some kind of information, how do you find it? And uh, I use, I'm using resource here in a very generic sense of any kind of identifiable item of interest. A lot of what we're, a lot of the resources we're talking about are things that, that are electronic that can be sent over the wire, so PDF files, database files. But we also have um, physical things, books in libraries sometimes that may not be available online but are still useful for people to know about, um, rock samples, um, chemical analyses, although they're typically represented in, in, data, in data tables. So the metadata is to allow discovery and evaluation of resources to determine if they're useful for some purpose that somebody needs information for. One of the important issues we have to deal with also in thinking about the catalog is the distinction between data and metadata. And this, of course, is a, you know, an ongoing metaphysical discussion in large part. But we try to, the, our, our approach is to just try to keep it practical. And the idea is the catalog is a fairly high-level resource. Um, things that have metadata records in the catalog would be things, documents, physical samples, data sets, services, softwares, software files, databases, things that are sort of aggregate, either individual units of information that somebody can search for and get as a unit. Whereas we don't create metadata records for things that are like individual chemical analysis, temperature measurements. So sort of record level or, or item level, um, discrete data, as um, commonly called, um, individual features in o OGC terms. And one of the reasons that we don't try to create metadata at this level is, is a lot of this kind of information starts to have very domain-specific description properties associated with it. So an individual chemical analysis will have a series of analytes, um, different oxides, element oxides that are in the analysis or something like that. And when somebody is searching for chemical analyses, a lot of times you'll want to search based on how much silica is, is present in the sample or how much gold is there. This isn't something that you would do through the metadata catalog. This is the, the, the workflow there would be you would discover a chemis, chemical anal, analysis service through the catalog and then go to that service to do the more specific, domain-specific search of the information, let's say in a chemical, um, in a geochemistry service or a geochronology service or some sort of, of uh, water chemistry service. So, it, so the, the, uh, in a lot of ways, the operational distinction between metadata and data is determined by how much 
about the resource you can successfully describe with the content model for the metadata. If you are seeing that, oh, you know, there's a lot of things about this data that I can't describe in the metadata the way it's currently configured, one of the first things that might occur to you would be maybe this shouldn't be metadata, maybe actually I'm dealing with data. And in, that's commonly the case. So um, on to the metadata content model. We have the, the basic content elements um, conform largely to what you know commonly is called Dublin Core metadata um, or you know what we're all used to in standard bibliographic information. There's something about a title a description, which is a free text description of what's in the resource, and, and as much information created that description to be useful for trying to find the resource and determine if it's what they need. Um, any kind of resource has some sort of originator, and that might be an author or an editor or a compiler. There's lots of different possible roles there. Some date of currentness for the content on which the, the information was published. Um, a lot of the things we're interested in, but not all of them, have are applicable to some geographic extent. Um, we want to have some kind of information about how to get the resource. That's the access instructions. Some way to contact the agent that you that is distributing the resource. So if you do want to get the resource, how do I contact the distributor? And then finally, some information to keep track of the metadata record itself, and that would be the date of most recent update for the metadata record, a contact for the metadata owner. In other words, if you find some problem in the metadata contact, in the metadata content for a record, let's say your name is spelled wrong, who do you talk to to try to get that fixed? Um, the metadata record needs to say what sort of content model of encoding specification is used. And this is necessary to allow the automated parsing and processing of metadata records. And then finally, we like to have an identifier, a unique identifier for the metadata record to allow easier harvesting and, and cloud metadata. It gives us a way to determine, one way to determine it. At a, at a slightly bigger level, then, we can also dive in. And there's some additional content which is extremely useful and we'd like to have. It's recommended. And, these include things like a bibliographic citation if the metadata is describing some kind of published document. Keywords are, are commonly used. We want to know what's the language that the, that the content of the, of the resource is in. Most of what we're dealing with will be in English, but not necessarily. And if it's not in English, it's useful to tell people that. Um, another thing that's important in the system for trying to deduplicate information is a, is a unique identifier for each resource. And of course, the assignment of these identifiers is a, is a difficult problem as well and, and something that will have to be an ongoing effort to work out. If we're dealing with subsurface information, it's useful to know the vertical extent. How deep in the borehole? Where is this well log? What's the depth interval that these samples were taken from? Some resources apply to a particular time interval. For a lot of the geologic resources we're interested in, that time interval might be a geologic era. There's some information that, that we can supply about the quality of the, the resource. What's the, what's the location access? We want to know how the information was collected. That comes in lineage. Is, are there constraints? Are there legal constraints on who can use this or how this information can be used? Um, a lot of the information in the system we'll be dealing with will be public, but there also will be commercial entities that will be working. And sometimes it's, we may have a metadata record that tells you that this information exists, but it's um, proprietary and you have to contact some, some company or maybe it's for sale or something like that. And then finally, we really want to have a URL, an online linkage to access resources that are available on the net. So that's the, that's the framework of the content model for the metadata. Um, there's a link down here at the bottom for, for a document we have on the uh, US GIN site that um, goes into the, this content model in a little more deca detail, discussing some of the use cases and, and providing a, a lot more sort of in-depth analysis of what these different content elements involve. So what does it look like? And uh, there's the idea there's a variety of different applications we're using. And because we're trying to standardize the metadata format, 
and the access through a service, the idea is that you can access the metadata equally um, well. And I just wanted to briefly show you a couple of these guys. Um, on This is a used to be a commercial extension product from, from ESRI, and last fall they released it as an open source. They released the code base for this, so it's now an open source project. And this is a, a Java application that's designed. It has a, a database behind it that stores the metadata. Um, it allows you to go in and search, so it provides a user interface for searching, and you can do. Um, simple searches. This is looking at, at um, our catalog. Right now we've got a bunch of the, of the well logs in here. Through this interface you can um, look at the, here's the more detailed view of the metadata. Um, so from the user point of view, there's a link here that lets you get at the, at the actual resource. Um, it comes in as a TIFF file. So this is a scanned well log is the resource that this record describes. And uh, there it is. You can scan it. You could, you could save this out and do other things with it if you wanted. So um, this also has a user interface for in putting in metadata records and doing some editing. I won't talk about that so much. I just mostly wanted to focus on the search functions here. This is another um, client application that is just a, it's a web application that runs in your desktop. This was, was built by a, uh, an open source project in Spain. It's called Catalog Connector. Um, through the GIN project, we've done a little work um, doing some fixes in the user interface. This is designed so you can set up configurations for a variety of different catalogs. Um, Excuse me, could you maximize it, please? So. Oh, sorry. Is it Thanks. still? Let's see. I should. Let me try and make it bigger here. Is that better? Thank you. Yep. Uh, um, you can pick different catalogs that you want to search here. So, so these are all CSW catalogs. The ones in red right now. Um, are offline for some reason, and we haven't cleaned up this configuration. Most of those are in Spain. I don't know what's going on there. But we have a Geon catalog here, and we also have the US Gen catalog that this client can access. And uh, I've just done a search here for geology and limited it to a bounding box up here in central Arizona. And it gives you a list of the resources. And again, you can open it up. Um, this shows a sketchier view of the metadata. You can also access the raw metadata files. Um, and then finally, another another catalog application that um, is commonly used is GeoNetwork. This is another um, very similar to GeoPortal. Um, searching for geology in here, we have a bunch of different stuff here, and it gives you another view of the uh, oh there I was missing it sorry. So this lists uh, this one is this one lists this is a service so this is a WMS service. Um, See one of the big issues with metadata is that if you don't put in good descriptions in your abstract, sometimes it's not very clear to people what what they found a metadata record for. So, good content is critical, particularly in things like that. You want to have an informative title and a useful abstract because in most cases, when somebody searches the metadata, this will be the first kind of view they get. They'll see a title, they'll see an abstract. In this case, you see some keywords. Um, and then they can dive in here, and there's, you know, they can go on and on. It shows a bounding box for where the uh, where the resource is. This is it's a uh, one geology um, WM, WMS, and this provides information for how you connect to it. This is the WMS connection point. So this is a uh, geo network. So those are just a, just a few of the um, client applications. Well, and geo network and geo portal are also also work on the server side. Um, for loading metadata and and other CSW clients can serve can search the metadata you have in a geoportal instance or a geo network instance. Oops, sorry about that. So 
how do we do it? Um, I've got there's two there's two flow charts here. If we start up at the top one, there's two situations, two starting points. You have some metadata in a table of some sort, or you're starting from scratch, which means you don't have anything, and you have to create the metadata records from nothing. So considering the situation where you have metadata in, in some sort of structured format already, I say table, but it might be uh, we were doing some work with the Great Basin Center. They had SGDC metadata. Um, they were able to extract that into a table. Um, we could have it in an Excel spreadsheet. In a lot of cases here at the Arizona survey, we had various other databases that had essentially metadata content in them that we were able to extract. So the process then is to load the data from whatever kind of structured format you have into the template file. And right now what we've got online at the stategeothermaldata.org site are a collection of Excel spreadsheets that essentially define a simple tab a table structure with a collection of fields for the content in them. And there are all kinds of different possible workflows for getting information from one structured format, whether it's a table or XML file, into another structured format. You can, a lot of this uh, we've been doing, you can fill in things in Excel. Um, you can work in Microsoft Access or some other relational database um, that lets you set up SQL queries. Um, Sometimes we've got some Python scripts that we use that we run um, that do some of the work for us. If you're working in Excel, you can sometimes do a lot of stuff with just filling down and copying and pasting. So this is a this is kind of a black box in this scheme, but but the trick is to get your content into the template, and and uh, whether it's in a you represent that template in an access table or a CSV file or an Excel spreadsheet, those are all workable forms. Um, once it's in the template, then you have to consider whether the the resources that you're describing and that you want to make accessible are they already online. Or, um, or not. So if, the, if you already have the files online, then w when you are loading the template, the trick is you have to get the URLs for the file locations into the URL field in the template. If you don't have the, um, the files online already, then you have to figure out, okay, where am I going to put the files? And that's where the, uh, you can either have put the files in a web accessible directory on a server that you have on your website, or they could go to one of the hubs. Is the philosophy um, so far? We haven't we haven't really made much use of the hubs, um, but the files just have to be in a web accessible location, and the URLs need to be in the metadata records in the template. And once that configuration is set up, then we come over here and we have a script that we run against that we export the the. Uh, Table data from whatever form it's in into a comma into a text file into comments with limited text, and then we have a program that we can run against that that, that creates the XML files that we put in a in a web accessible directory, and the GeoPortal our catalog harvests those, and the records end up in the metadata catalog to be searched. So, um, again, what what does that look like? So this is a this is a, a directory on our web server. It's got a, you know hundreds of PDF files in here. This is the web accessible directory. So this is this is where the URLs point, and um, oops. and this is this is the directory that has all the, all the metadata files that were spewed out by processing a table. So it's just a whole list of files. We point the geoportal at this directory, and it, base, it reads these files in and creates the metadata records in the catalog. So the workflow is you get the you get the metadata in the template. You make sure that you have URLs in the template that point at the file location online, um, and then um, we can take that script and run it. Or we could also um, we're 
probably make that script available online so anybody could run it. And you'll just have to point it at your own web accessible directory. And any of the any catalog instance in the network could be watching these web accessible directories to harvest metadata. Um, so that's the, that's the workflow if you have the data in some tabular form. If you're starting from scratch, then we have a couple different forks for how you might proceed. And again, it mostly depends on whether your files are already online somewhere, so you have URLs for them that you'll put in the metadata, or whether you actually need to upload the files. So if the 